We know SMEs are known to be the bedrock of any economy. They are marginalized as a result of poor linkages to complex supply chains, the lack of digital tools, and opaque pricing. The need to enhance SME productivity and engagement is local and international across supply chains, and that has become more apparent as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. In this session, we're going to draw highlights from policy and industry experts on digitizing the Afro-Asian SME corridor and the untapped opportunities in the multi-trillion dollar economic zone. And I'll go straight to my panelists and start with um, Dr. Maxwell Lokuku Afari. So Dr. Afari, can you tell us why do strategies to promote the development of SMEs have limited impact on their growth and employment operations in the region? Thank you very much, Professor Lainka David West, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to panelists and all participants and listeners. Let me go straight to Prof. your question, why has policies and strategies not impacted on SMEs in our region? Prof, you realize that with SME, we need a very holistic approach to the development of SMEs in our region. This approach must look at both the micro level and the macro level to target specifically SMEs. But fundamentally, we need a sound, stable macroeconomic environment, an environment that promises low inflation, low interest rate, exchange rate stability. Those are fundamental, very necessary conditions. And this is an area that the sub-region has done very well in the last decade. We've had challenges recently, but I think that we are beginning to see the gains from good policies that have been introduced over the last decade. Beyond that, Prof, most of the times, SMB developments have not been embedded in national development strategies. How am I saying that? Because most of the time, national development strategies are not really focusing and targeting SME development. SME strategies and programs have been segregated and assigned to various public sector institutions where both capacities and authority to actually coordinate are weak. And that is where we need to look at in terms of uh, uh, the policies to target SMEs, to make it focused, targeted, and sharp. And it is for this reason that Prof, I'm very particularly interested and excited about the ongoing work between the government of Ghana and the government of Singapore working through the Bank of Ghana and the MAS to set up the financial trust corridor. We expect that this financial trust corridor concept will increase financial services between the two countries and, and, and the two regions, and especially payments for SMEs and businesses in the support of trade. Once we have such policies in place, sitting on a national development strategy agenda, having as a necessary condition, stable and macroeconomic environment, and with targeted policies that are intertwined with national strategies, we expect that we're beginning to see an impact on SME development in the region. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Koko Afari, for setting the tone. And you basically told us, other than an enabling environment at the macro level, we also need to make SME policies part of public policy decisions. But I think where you also came out was the issue about the, the corridors, which we'll ask uh, Dr. Ortiz to speak to us around in terms of the financial policies as a commercial banker. But I'll now go to um, Dr. Sahai. Dr. Sahai, basically, we know them. Dr. Maxwell mentioned this issue about the micro environment, and I want you to speak to that micro in terms of what's the current state of Afro-Asia trade, and where do you see the gaps, and what strategies can we use to build and enhance the linkages? In fact, uh, if you look into the SMEs, there's not much difference between SMEs of India and Africa. They face the same kind of handicap. It's a barrier of, to the entry, growth, and exit. Uh, we, in fact, require a huge infusion of technology in the sector, and empirical studies have revealed that infusion of the technology brings out the operational cost, brings innovation, provide market access to, to the SMEs, and also it's a cost effective. I think at this point of time, we need to look into how we can provide much technology to SMEs. And taking an example of India, recently only, we have increased the threshold limit for SMEs in India by five times, taking it from 100 million rupees to 500 million rupees, so that more and more technology can be brought into them. 
We have also excluded export turnover from the threshold limit so that there is internationalization of the SMEs. We should also realize that the time has come where we require new financing tool. Gone are the days where we were on the uh, capital subsidy or giving a priority sector status to the SME. We now require new financing tools. And uh, let me highlight an example of India where we have come with what is a credit system. It's a trade receivable discounting system, which is basically for discounting and financing of bill of SMEs and electronic platform where SME puts the bill, the supplier approves it, and there is bidding by the financial institution. It has reduced the cost of interest for the SME. The loan is available without collateral. It is without recourse. Similarly, I think a lot of SMEs are quite viable, both in Asia and Africa. We need to have an exclusive platform for dealing with the SMEs stock. And viable SMEs can definitely bring down the cost by moving from financing to the entire equity mode. Uh, I think we require an entire ecosystem for helping the SME. It has to be a digital ecosystem, which will entail, first of all, a very high speed interconnectivity through broadband. We also require digital skilling of the workforce. We require digital platform cross-border trade. We also require digital payment mechanism. And what is very, very encouraging for us is that uh, this digital payment is growing by leaps and bounds, not only in Asia, but also in countries of Af Africa, particularly South Africa, Nigeria, or Kenya. In India, it is growing by a compound annual growth rate of over 55%. We have already the 35 trillion rupee mark in 2020, and we are looking into the digital payment to go to $100 trillion. So I think if we provide an ecosystem, uh, the SMEs are there to capture a greater share of the global trade. And one solution which I always look into a cross-border e-commerce trade because the conventional mode of trading is still very costly for the SMEs. So if we go for the new digital instruments, I think we can cover a lot of resistance. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Sahai. And I think what you're saying is, uh, in addition to digitizing the SMEs, providing that infrastructure that we need, the broadband, the skills, but we also need to ensure that the financial flows can move with the digital payment infrastructure that we have. But I think that also the platformization of the, of the SME spaces and ecosystems to ensure that we can actually have operational efficiencies in their business flows and supply chains to keep their costs lower as well and to get them access to the markets that they need. So, Minister Paula, thank you very much for joining us this morning. And I want to come to you in terms of the digitizing SMEs. And I know that this is one of the biggest areas, especially as uh, Dr. Sahai also spoke to in terms of the costing of the technologies. But then, from your perspective on the work you've been doing in Rwanda, can digital technologies usher a new era of resilience, growth, and quality employment among the generation of SMEs in this region? Thank you. Uh, and I think I'll also build off uh, from what uh, Dr. Sahai uh, discussed because he touched on some of the things I wanted to highlight. And, and maybe just uh, uh, when you look at the African continent, uh, just looking at the statistics, you see that uh, SMEs employ at least 60 to 70 percent uh, of their labor force. So that's the majority of the labor force. But the interesting bit about that labor force is that you find the poorest and most vulnerable of the society are the ones that are still employed by, uh, you know, by these SMEs that make up the majority of the labor force. And then the other thing you, you start, you also see a trend on the continent is that uh, SMEs will also form 90 percent of businesses on the continent. So you have 90 percent of businesses on the continent. But they reflect, uh, you know, 60 to 70 percent of the, uh, you know, the labor force, which also employs the majority of those that are vulnerable within our society. So there's there's a bit of a disconnect, and I think the statistics do tell a story uh, about how uh, less productive our SMEs are than the larger corporations. And when you look at some of the efforts different governments have put in place, when you look at the doing business uh, reforms, which are really around the regulatory reforms that are required, rankings are still low. And so there's definitely a gap between what else needs to be done to unlock the potential, but also to make these SMEs uh, more competitive. Back to your question around, uh, you know, how do we, I think the short answer is yes, digital technologies can uh, improve growth, 
resilience and quality employment. So we need to be very, um, uh, you know, deliberate and, and targeted towards what exactly uh, are we saying when we talk about digital technologies. It's not a one size fits all. You need to look at the type of skills and talents that you have that these these SMEs are employing. Um, you need to look at the you know the scale of the business and really adjust and see what some of those tools that are really going to, to allow them to go to the next level. Um, I wanted to touch very quickly on, on some of the things uh, that I think can be very helpful when using digital technologies. I think one, we're talking that the SMEs employ uh, the most vulnerable, the poorest, or maybe those that are not very well educated. How do we use digital technologies and platforms to allow them to have better access to skills and talent? Because in many times they're probably just really limited to uh, you know, certain challenges that don't allow them to have the right recruitment processes in place, but also I think it will come back to the bigger question, which is around not having sufficient financing to be able to afford to employ the best of the talents that you can find. And so I think access to finance is highlighted for SMEs generally across the continent. And um, this is where digital tools are are able to unlock the potential. We've started to see where digital financial, financial innovations, uh, fintech innovations, have allowed for easy access and lending uh, to SMEs, where they've reduced the cost inevitably. Uh, I think the traditional uh, financing instruments that we have around the continent, the credit, the, being able to prove your credit worthy as an SME. Uh, is such a lengthy and bureaucratic process, but also sometimes has its own unfavorable terms that don't allow everyone to get what they're looking for. And uh, the other one is, of course, access to markets, which is very critical. I think SME competitiveness is really driven by how how uh, how big a market you can access uh, beyond the jurisdiction within which you're in. And so the internet is able to allow these SMEs to access markets, and which is why some of the investments we have to make in digital infrastructure and making sure it's accessible and affordable for everyone is very important because then you're able to broaden uh, their market, uh, the, the, the market that they can, can tap into. Then the last two things I want to highlight is around collaboration and communication, which I think is critical. And the other one is around capacity development. Um, the internet, the, all the resources we have available can enable SMEs to be able to really do the right capacity that they need, uh, tap into extensive advisory services that will build their business skills as they grow uh, the different uh, you know, businesses. And finally, of course, it's really around product development, you know, being able to crowdsource the ideas, understand what the market is looking for and the for it. So really, that is just a, you know, a short list of the potential of, the, of digital technologies and the ability to use digital to be able to enhance growth and become resilient, especially in a time like now where we're all uh, you know, fighting with the pandemic. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Ms. Nibari. But I think you've mentioned quite a few things, access to digital, access to finance, access to markets, and also this issue about the SMEs don't just need all these things, but they also need the capacity in terms of business advisory services and as enhancing their product development all the way to delivery as well. So Dr. Ortiz, I'm going to come to you now because there's been a lot of talk about access to finance and I'm, I'm looking at it from two perspectives now. There's the access to finance in terms of enhancing SMEs' ability to get finance for them, which is almost the bane of all SMEs across the world. Anyway, I don't have enough money. Then the second is what uh, Dr. Sahai and uh, Dr. Maxwell also spoke about, which is the issue about the financial flows and the opening of the trade borders across the Afro-Asia corridor. So let's start with access to finance. How do we enhance that for SMEs across across the landscape? Well, we're actually working on it and um, we have actual live uh, executions. So there are two categories. First, we have SMEs that are part of large company ecosystems, either the supply chain or the distribution chain. And so those SMEs, we have put into what we call a, it's actually a blockchain based uh, financial supply chain platform. And as a consequence of that, uh, we as a bank now have a view of the actual payment flows, order flows, uh, performance uh, execution of these SMEs, either on the supply side or on the distribution side relative to that large corporate. It now becomes easy for us to do a data-driven financing scheme for those SMEs because we don't need collateral. 
We just need to be seeing those flows as they come along on our platform. So it becomes very clear and that's happening today. Now, there are a lot of SMEs that are outside of an ecosystem. They're community-based mainly and, and pretty much uh, constrained by their geography. We've built four platforms. Well, one is a joint venture, one is Global Linker, and Global Linker is Asia-wide, and it is kind of a matchmaking platform and a networking platform where people, different SMEs across Asia, uh, which therefore broadens the supply chain of an SME or the, uh, the marketing uh, network of that SME. It also has uh, advisory and conversations that they can help each other solve challenges or get ideas. But more importantly, that channel has several subscriber-based microservices which exist today where they can buy ERP solutions for $7 a month, HR solutions, uh, inventory management solutions, all sorts of accounting so solutions, logistics uh, solutions on a subscriber-based service. And it helps them therefore digitize their own processes, which is an important precondition for them to go on into a digital platform. The other three uh, platforms that we've built is uh, Centro, which is a plug and play e-commerce uh, site so that they can easily put up their e-commerce site. We have Box, which allows the SME to accept several payment methodologies and many of our economies are still cash based, including cash using 50,000 nationwide uh, counters. So that expands their ability to sell and receive payment across. And the last piece answers your question, which is CCAP, which is a lending platform, but it's agnostic. So using that same database that I described to you of the uh, transactions that are executed digitally through transaction management uh, uh, systems in the platform, you know, e-invoicing, e-purchase order, and the settlement in, in the box platform. CCAP is not only Union Bank, we're one of the lenders, but we broaden it to include other lenders, some of whom are specialized in microfinance and in SME lending, and including ourselves that we're entering into that market. Now that's purely domestic, except for the matchmaking platform that I mentioned, which is a global linker, which is Asia wide. But here in the SFF, I think I think it's going to be launched. I saw in the schedule, you have this uh, Proxterra, which is a cross-border system where uh, uh, fund um, sponsored by the MAS and the IMDA which basically allows these platforms that I described to you to be integrated into Proxterra and automatically now these SMEs get access to a larger base of buyers and sellers globally to transaction management system to some of these services that I mentioned earlier about ERP and solutions and most importantly finance that can now be uh, brought to them using the same data that I described in, uh, in the domestic transaction, which we will see in our platform, even though it's now a cross-border transaction. So I think that that whole uh, ecosystem for the standalone SMEs, plus what we're doing for the SMEs that are part of a large corporate ecosystem, which is where we started, uh, and it's probably the easier thing to do, is uh, basically our involvement in what was mentioned earlier, the platformication of the SME trade floor, which I think is very important in terms of expanding their markets, in terms of others discovering alternative supply chains, and most importantly, because of the transaction management system, it's trustworthy. 
And that trustworthy data can now be used to produce um, financial options because the, the flows are evident. Great. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. And I think that what you've just mentioned is this issue about a platform in a platform. So we go from ecosystems to communities, and now we're going geographical as well, which is excellent. So let me come to you, Dr. Um, Dr. Maxwell, because I think that also, how do we also use policy to enable this type of infrastructure that we're seeing right now? Because while we know, so right now, I know that I can go on to Dr. Ortiz's platform as an SME and get, a, and get access to finance. How do we ensure that we can also manage the outflows and the inflows across the policy lines as well? Well, thank you very much, Prof. Um, I think that for, I want to touch on three key things. The first one I want to touch on is the uh, coordinated need to have a national policy to promote the use of digital technology. And that should be an integral part of a national policy. For instance, in Ghana, the government has uh, set up the financial development and inclusion strategy that has key pillars. One of them is the e-government digital economy. The second one is cash light uh, 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 society. So it's not cashless, but cashless society. And, and, and these uh, pillars are being driven as a national strategy, and that permeates through the system. And the government is leading by example by actually making sure that all government services become e-government e -E and encourage local fintechs and local SMEs to actually uh, be the, the, the providers of these services. So that's, that's one of the things I want to talk about. And then to be able to have that to, 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 to become embedded, we actually need a vibrant local fintech and entrepreneur industry that understands and responds to the digital needs of SMEs. Because without that local fintech and entrepreneur section that can support the SMEs and respond to their needs, we will not be able to get these SMEs hooking up to technology or digital technologies to be able to drive their businesses. So that has to be a policy that should be driven right from the top to ensure that that happens. And I will say that in Ghana, we passed the Payment System and Services Act that actually allowed the Bank of Ghana to, for the first time, license and regulate SMEs and also to encourage them to be innovative. And by doing that, the central bank set up the FinTech and Innovation Office that specifically targets SMEs and encourage them, uh, target fintechs and encourage them to take up businesses and penetrate through the, the, the micro and the small sectors of the economy to get them to onboard onto digital uh, processes. And the last one I want to talk about is uh, promoting confidence. And one of the areas that we can promote confidence is to ensure that the necessary regulatory frameworks are in place. We can talk about ensuring that data protection is in place and is being enforced. We can talk about consumer protection and recourse mechanisms. If we want SMEs to actually take up digital technologies as part of their mainstream, we can talk about dispute resolutions, and we can also talk about cyber and information security guidelines. Once we have all these things in place, it will help to enhance confidence for SMEs to be able to go into digital technologies and for their customers to feel comfortable to want to engage in that area. So I think that this is where policy can make a very huge impact to encourage the digitization of SMEs in, in, in the region. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Dr. Maxwell. And I think that we are really looking at how do we also fuse local innovation systems to ensure that we have local innovation systems work as part of this ecosystem so we're not just also importing because of some of the local nuances that we have in our markets. Dr. Sahai, is this something that we you see in terms of digitizing SMEs in the regions and what constraints will they face in terms of building and digitizing their businesses? Because India has a good example, but as we grow out, how do we, what are the constraints that we should expect? So in fact, uh, if you look at uh, in Asia's relations with Africa, we are the largest trading partner of Africa, contributing 44% of their exports, and we also account for 38% of their imports. But when it comes to the cross-border e-commerce, neither share of Asia nor share of Africa is more than 1%. And I have been a great votary of cross-border e-commerce trade 
because as an SME, you are looking for two things. One is a genuine buyer and you want to ensure against payment. These marketplaces provides the both. If your product is good, the bar will come online, payment is ensured through payment gateway. We have successful stories in India where women from a distant village areas, they have put their products and they have not only generated huge profit, they have converted the entire village population into smart entrepreneurs. So I think both for Asia and Africa, cross-border e-commerce can be a game changer. But here, a lot of responsibility and initiative has to be rest with the government. We require investment in ICT and infrastructure. We need to emphasize on fiber network, cloud computing, spectrum allocation, and competition. Uh, I think as a larger issue, we need to look into whether science, technology, engineering, and mathematics can be brought into the educational curriculum and can we provide vocational and technical training under the private-public partnership? Because if you're not doing that, we will have young people who will be application operator who can address the specific issue, but they will not be informed or empowered individual who can channelize or harness the social customs and unfold the power of e-commerce. Digital solution is the only way to move forward for the SMEs, both of Asia and Africa. Okay, great, Dr. Sahai. And thank you for raising those issues in terms of the involvement of government and private sector and the enhancement of skills. Dr. Ortiz, before we go to questions, I'm going to come and ask you one, quest one final question. You mentioned building trust. And don't forget that most of Africa is still very cash heavy. How do we build trust in a cash in a cash environment, especially with digital payments and digital channels and these issues of cybersecurity? Well, I mean, I think cash won't work in a cross-border environment, but clearly domestically, as I mentioned to you, we have uh, in that box platform connected with pawn shops with courier services, with uh, different uh, um, uh, rural banks to accept cash. And because it's in a digital platform, it recognizes that payment in favor of an SME that may be remotely uh, remote from the buyer or, or the seller in this case, right? So that's how we solve that problem. So cross-border, I think, will need to be a digital process, obviously. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think we can do cash across. There's foreign exchange issues and different things. But it's worked very well. So like I said, we, have put toge we only have, as a bank, 300 branches. But we've put together 50,000 counters uh, to basically accept cash for those that are in that platform. So that has been very efficient. It works like a dream. It's connected to our national retail payment system. And then those counters now remit the payment to us or to the customer's uh, bank through the platform. Great. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. And what I'm hearing is that also in addition to having the branches on the platforms, we still need last mile distribution capabilities. And so we have one question from uh, our viewers, and this is about, uh, so I'll read the question. Could Ghana elaborate about the interesting financial trust, financial trust corridor initiated with MAS? How could this help SMEs in Africa in terms of greater trade and faster financial support? So Dr. Matulo Fokofari, I guess that's for you. Yes. Now, thank you very much. This process is currently ongoing between the two institutions. What we need, we are trying to do is to establish a framework for trust and data sharing between the two regions. Uh, agreement on common data fields that can be shared between the two regions. We are looking at how we can align our regulatory requirements to enhance financial flows between the two regions. We are looking at how we can whitelist financial institutions businesses, especially SMEs, and industry, industry verticals for mutual financial services. So once these are put in place and this MOU is signed between the two regions, 
we expect that this will increase financial services between the two regions, especially between Ghana and Singapore, and then extend it between the uh, sub-region in Africa and the Af Asian region. We also expect that payments between the two regions, once the financial institutions, businesses, especially SMEs, are, have been whitelisted, then we expect free flow of payments between the two regions to encourage trade between the two regions. So that's what we are working on now to develop that framework which would then be the standard between the two regions. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Maxwell. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to say thank you to our panelists, Dr. Ahisa Hai, Dr. Justo Otis, and Dr. Maxwell Opoku Afari, and Ms. Paula Inibire. And we know that digital can really enable the Afro-Asia corridor, but we need the policies and the environment and the technology infrastructures and the trust to ensure that we can do it. Thank you very much for listening and joining us, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you, dear panelists, again. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank, thank you. you.